Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you by Growmark FS. Keeping up with the latest in ag is a challenge, to say the least, but there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic grain and energy solutions born of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up to date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. And good afternoon. Welcome into Market Talk for this Wednesday, June 9th. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. Great to have you here with us. MarketTalkAg.com. That is our home on the web, the all-new MarketTalkAg.com. Check it out today. A lot of great stuff there for you to uh, view and check out and watch and listen to. All of our uh, streaming sources, our radio station affiliates, everything, it's all online. MarketTalkAg.com. We have quite a bit to talk about on today's show. Let's bring in our good friend, Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. And Mike, Good afternoon to you, and you know it's hard to even say where to begin uh, with this market. But I think overall today there was a couple things, but maybe some position squaring ahead of tomorrow's uh, highly anticipated USDA reports on that grain side. Seemed like that was maybe a bit of the case today. Yeah, I think you had a really good um, setup for the WASDI report and the weather market, um, because I think you have a situation in Wednesday's trade, Jesse, where you had not only a lot drier weather forecast start to blend through into the commentary in Chicago, Northern Plains areas did not get as much rains as models forecasted. The GFS model, in my opinion, which has been wetter and has been more broad ranging for rainfall, is starting to move towards the European model, which has been very, very conservative on amounts and locations and, and coverage areas. And so you have net net a reason, I think, to buy into the markets before the report. Um, and, and especially given that the ethanol number, the ethanol production number on Wednesday really surprised a lot in the trade. We hit the best level of production since March 1 of 2020. So we are back to where we were before COVID and uh, sucking down the ethanol as well with production only, the production going up and the stocks only going up slightly. So what was the issue for why the, the most of the market other than the corn was lower? I think it was pre-report jitters. I think you're right. But I also think that we saw another move by China after they showed a 9% PPI producer price index inflation for the month of May, um, those pr producer price index numbers continue to jump. And I think because of that, China worked hard in talking again about limiting commodity uh, demand through entering some more state reserves from pork. Uh, they talked about food security a lot more. Um, you're going to see this over and over again, I think, where the Chinese and other governments, too, will really work hard in trying to push down prices on the demand side. We saw, I think, late last week where Russia was looking at limiting uh, the amount of wheat exports again in an attempt to calm their inflationary pressures down as well. So I think this is the battle lines that are being drawn up here as we get into the heart of summer. Well, Mike, let's talk corn because that market uh, was down today and then flipped its way back around and finished mostly higher. And, uh, you know, just looking at corn heading into this report, I know a lot of folks are focused on that Brazil number, the weather. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of issues shaping up here for the corn market in general. Talk about what you're seeing in corn right now. Well, the biggest negative continues to be the wheat market. And I guess I feel as though, Jesse, maybe we've done enough damage to the wheat price um, and we've gotten the, the value numbers and, and prices down low enough. Algeria bought uh, reportedly 480,000 tons of wheat uh, in the late afternoon trade before the market closed. I know we're probably not going to get any of that, but it was around $300 a ton, cost and freight included. Probably go to the Black Sea because of that freight. But we're all competitive now. France, United States, very competitive with one another. And we saw that wheat corn spread get deeper in the red to where it went seven, eight cents negative uh, in the soft red wheat minus the corn. So what we saw, too, I think, technically speaking, in the corn market after the ethanol numbers came back out and the, uh, and the wheat came back around was we had to fill a gap or I think we had to fill a gap before this report came out. And 
That's what we're looking at here is December futures on the electronic. Uh, we filled a gap on the uh, uh, Wednesday trade from about two days ago, right around the first part of the week. And now that chart looks pretty healthy from a standpoint of a nice steep uptrend that's held intact and we've got the gap filled. One other thing that I'll throw out here to the viewer is the value level analysis that I do is, uh, is pretty important at this time of year because that 530 overvalue line that I have is a drought overvalue line. In other words, I'm assuming 92 million acres. I'm assuming about a 175 yield at this point. That puts me at about a 1.4 billion bushel carryover. That's my overvalue for the drought scenario or minimal drought scenario. The 445 overvalue level in blue way down towards all the support and down towards the 200 a day moving average and the orange trend line support, that's an over, that was an overvalue level in case we stayed up around that 180 yield by USDA. So this year I did a little bit differently because of the drought in South America and what we're looking at as far as tight stocks to use ratios here in this country. Um, I added a, a second overvalue and undervalue line for corn and beans. That overvalue line of 530 could change after uh, the Thursday report, because I'll put it to you very simply, Jesse, for me, if you don't take anything else away from today's video talk, I think that if we don't get the rains that are forecast with 45% of Iowa in drought right now for corn areas, I think the drought monitor could far outweigh what the WASDE report says on Thursday. If these weather models and the rainfall in Northern Plains, Plains going into the weekend look very, very minimal. And I think that's Really, I think that's pretty solid analysis at this point because we can't really mess around with any more loss of crop conditions at this stage of the game because we all pretty much know that we've been in this business long enough. If you have a dry June, it's really hard to get a wet July to offset it. So we're coming in really at a key point to recharge moisture levels to get that next level of growth for the corn. And I'm glad you mentioned Iowa, Mike, because I think a lot of folks, you know, we we know how dry it is, the Dakotas, the Northwestern Corn Belt, the Northern Plains, but Iowa's really starting to become kind of a swing state. If they can catch some rain, we'll be okay. But if Iowa continues to trend drier, I mean, that's that's corn country. We we know it. That's going to be tough on this corn crop, Mike. Yes, and, and you've got Minnesota in that same area of droughty potential, and you've got northwest Illinois in that same area. And so you've got a big chunk of the national corn yield that could be in 30 days looking at a 2012 scenario. And while I think there's a lot of similarities to 2008 still, this feels like 2012 again from a standpoint of I was living in north central Indiana, the crop was burning up. I was talking to news wires, telling them the crop was burning up and nobody cared until about June, roughly or mid to late June, because Iowa was doing so well, South Dakota, these Western Corn Belt states were doing so well. It really didn't matter what was going on in Illinois, Indiana and Ohio at that point. But then all of a sudden everything changed. And I kind of feel the same way. We've got some really good crops being grown regionally, there's a really big chunk of the primary corn belt that's in, in tough shape. And as you said, South Dakota is coming in 45, 46% good to excellent in corn and beans. Iowa is still in the mid seventies. It could be though going down towards 50% in the next 30 days if we don't get these rains. Why? Because we're heating up to above normal temperatures for June. And again, the, the weather models didn't capture this. The long-term models really didn't capture this at all. They said a little bit warmer, nothing like what we may be in store for. Well, Mike, flipping the script to soybeans, you know, we, we think about quarter beans this early in the season and, and soybeans can maybe take a little bit more heat stress early on, but, you know, still something we have to watch. And, and looking at the soybean chart, we were down pretty hard today on Wednesday. Um, what are you seeing in soybeans right now? What are some things we need to watch? You know, I think the soy oil continues to be a real tough nut to crack because it goes up and makes historic highs and then immediately sells off. And I think it really does feel a lot like 2008 because soybean oil really led the show early in the year. And that's what we're looking at here is a Nov 2008 bean chart with the red and green bars, whereas the Nov 21 electronic uh, trading day trade beans uh, is in the purple. And so, Jesse, I guess I feel like that we're in kind of crunch time for the soybeans because 
What we did back in 2012 between mid-June and early mid-July was made a head and shoulders top. You kind of see a left shoulder, a head, and then a right shoulder over the course of about a 30-day window in that 2008 November contract. We're right with the same price as where we were. We're almost identical in terms of price action since the middle later part of May. So I think tomorrow's report, Thursday's report, I think is actually much more important for the soybeans to see if they replicate this type of price action or not. And if they do, and we go up another leg with Argentina 99% harvested and looking like they're going to get a 46 or 47 million ton crop with Argentine meal prices well underneath U.S. meal prices and with the Brazilian crop reportedly still on track for a 136, maybe even a 138 uh, production number, I think beans still are the key leaders to the downside once that bean oil corrects. Well, that's definitely something we're going to have to watch. And I, I think overall, you know, this has been an interesting market trade. We've rallied off weather. And then, you know, you mentioned weather models and uh, conflicting weather models. It just seems like we're getting into a different day and age in the market trade here, Mike, where you know, we're trading more or less the headlines and we're trading all these different weather models. And it really just it makes it makes an interesting dynamic in our market trade as a whole. And I think we've been seeing that play out more and more here in recent weeks. Without a doubt. And, you know, you and I have talked about this historic volatility in my views that it's just going to continue all the way through August, September. Why is that? Because of the stocks to use ratios, both domestically and globally, they're just too tight. And that's why we're trading these news headlines so closely. But I think if you boil it down for a rancher who needs to buy feed or a grain marketer who needs to hedge, I think it really boils down to you're going to have inflation on the demand side as a big headwind the second half of the year. I just got done writing a special report on inflation, focusing on China and the United States. It's interesting to note, Jesse, our producer price index in the United States is nine and a half percent and China's is nine percent. We're almost identical in terms of what kind of inflationary pressure we're seeing and inflationary pressure in the case of the United States and China. Again, not not being seen since 2008. So very similar analysis there. And remember, 2008 made for a very tough 2009 when it came to prices. And so inflation and demand are going to be a headwind for the grain marketer in the second half of the year. I feel confident in saying that. Um, and I think it's it's easy to say at this point because of the weather market and the weather models that you bring up that supply can offset it. And that's why the WASDE report and what China may try and do or what a U.S. government may try to do in terms of keeping a cheap food policy or Russia, whoever it may be, they really, it really won't matter that much as long as the weather continues to keep the stocks to use ratios low. That's the game we're going to have to play. And that's why I still really like those bought puts because it really keeps me open from overselling my cash bushels. Mike, let's change over to livestock and uh, talk this hog market, I think, here for a little bit. As we've just seen, you know, in impressive numbers, hog contracts trading at a premium to, to fat cattle, live cattle contracts. I mean, it, it's just been an interesting dynamic. Product prices keep going through the roof, it seems. Where are we at with this hog market, though? I mean, are, are we at a point where we're going to run out of steam soon? I know we've had this discussion before, but, man, it just seems like we almost have to be there, right? Yeah, and this is where, you know, when I started doing my own business back 26 years ago and decided to do my own analysis and not purchase analysis, the biggest reason was because not just to be right, but just as importantly to be wrong, because when you're wrong, you got to go back and look and see why you're wrong and do kind of a corrective action. And that's where I've been in the hog market. I talked about a big correction and maybe the, the rocket fuel ending with the May contract going off the board. That has not happened. And so we've set ourselves up for a major run. We've got pork cutout values running higher with the ham cutout, which that doesn't oftentimes happen. Now you see in the yellow and the red uh, bars here, the red and yellow lines here, I should say, that ever since 2017, uh, those two, the hams and the pork cutout, have tended to run together pretty nicely, but it hasn't always been that way. But because they are running so well, and we see that the bellies are back up to where they were back in the second quarter or close to it, and back up close to last year's highs, they're not far away at all from taking out last year's highs of about 207, 208, 
And then that sets them up for a 2017 test for the high of around $215. Those are all on closing basis because it's a line chart. So my sense is, is that these hogs have more upside led by the bellies because we're going into the bacon, lettuce, tomato seasonal here as we get into the heart of the summertime. And if bellies can take us higher, then the bellies take the pressure off the hams and the pork cutout can stay elevated. And because I continue to hear of, of tight market ready supplies from the disease pressure back last spring, I think for the corrective action and why we didn't correct in May any deeper than we should have, it's because of that, Jesse. So that's the, the hog market. And, and if you intertwine that with the cattle market, I think you're finally starting to see because year to date pork production is down about 20.6%, beef production is down almost 15%. Because you're seeing both of these production levels drop because weights are down three pounds in the dress market for each of them, you're starting to see, I think, the hogs finally support the cattle market. And I'd look for that to increase as we get into the heart of summer. I'm not sure we're going to have a really good grilling season. I think it's going to be decent, but I don't think it's going to be stellar just because of the high prices and because of the gasoline prices that we're starting to feel as well. Yeah, and to your point of that, seeing the hog market start to support the cattle market, I, I think a lot of folks are just at the point with the cattle market where their their eyes are on the third and fourth quarter, and they're looking, you know, can we get through the glut of cattle we have? Can we get through all the issues we have in this cattle market? And, and that seems to be the window where a lot of people are thinking we're going to have somewhat of a recovery in this cattle market. Yeah, and this is where it goes back to the grain markets and why those dressed weights had to come down. That's one of the things we talked about many, many months ago is it was not going to happen that we were going to have these kind of prices in the hogs, even in the hogs, unless the weights started to come down in cattle and hogs. I also think that at some point, the taste and preference is going to kick in because chicken is, is very available in, in many cuts, and it's been very effective in competing with the red meat because of the cost. Uh, I think pork has also been very competitive to a degree, but I think at some point the consumer, especially in the United States, is going to get kind of tired of eating pork and eating chicken and really want to grill out and do a lot more with the beef. And so that's what I'd be looking for here in the next 20 to 30 days on those weekly reports that USDA puts out on the retail featuring report and see if the retail featuring and the ads from the grocery stores don't really start to pick up and feature beef a lot more aggressively. I think that's right around the corner. So my sense is, is that I'm still going to stay very current in my marketings on the cash side, but there's no premium in the fat cattle to hedge here at this stage of the game as, as you get out to uh, the, the fall months. Now, as you get out into December, you know, you're starting to get closer to 130 in the December fats. That's always attractive for me to keep an eye out for. So 132, 135 December fats, that's a real key area that I'll be watching to potentially hedge, even though supplies will be going down. Well, Mike, I know you mentioned earlier you're working on a special report on inflation, not to give too much away on that or anything else, but any any thoughts uh, on the state of inflation right now or any outside market features we're watching here as we get into the month of June? I tried to lay out really clearly, Jesse, in a short period of time, a, a very strong analysis that that the emerging markets are what drives commodity prices and commodity investments higher. But the Federal Reserve essentially controls, for lack of a better word, by their policy, how investors view emerging markets. And I made a compelling argument that the Federal Reserve is going to have to move sooner than what the market is assuming and pricing in right now. And if they do, it's going to hurt the commodities and it's going to hurt the commodities through the emerging markets. And so laid that out in last weekend special report. Please go to the website and take a look uh, at signing up for a free trial, and I'll be sure to get you that. Yeah, and I know a lot of great stuff you have on the website that people could check out. Globalcomresearch.com. That's globalcomresearch.com, uh, com with two M's in there. Mike, any other final thoughts or anything you want to reiterate for us uh, here on today's show as we head into Thursday's WASD report? I think next week we'll be able to talk about whether we have a real 2012 weather market on our hands or not, Jesse. That's what I'm looking forward to. I think that'll be the case for sure. With that, Mike Zuzalo, Global Commodity Analytics. Again, sign up for a free trial. Check out more. Globalcomresearch.com. Mike, always appreciate the time. Thanks again. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for having me. 
Mike Zuzalo, Global Commodity Analytics, our guest today on Market Talk, brought to you by Growmark FS. Find us online, markettalkag.com. This has been the Wednesday, June 9th edition of the show. I'm Jesse Allen, wishing you a great rest of your afternoon.